It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Leisha Palin to you today. Uh, she's a longtime friend and colleague. Um, this is some of it of homecoming for her. She got her PhD here in 1998 when this building didn't exist. In fact, she said she moved three buildings while she was there, ending up in ICS2. Um, she is a professor of computer science, professor, professor of information science, but more importantly, the new founding chair of the Department of Information Science at the University of Colorado, Boulder. Yes. Um, so she is the uh, founder of the area she is the highest scholar in, crisis <laughs> informatics. She founded the field and she's a very renowned scholar and that's what she's going to talk to us about today. Leisha. Thank you. Thanks everyone. In my, in my, turn my mic on. Did I turn it on? Am I good? Can you guys hear me? No. Yes. I can't decide if I turned it off or turned it on. I think I turned it off. Should we turn it on? How about now? Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. So thank you, Judy. It feels, it feels great to be back at UCI, and if I think about it too much, I get a little teary-eyed, and that's not good. But I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy to see your, what I think are your new surroundings, but I think you're quite used to them by now. Um, anyway, I felt like I got a really great start here, um, and um, uh, very, very much about the um, importance of thinking diversely and broadly on informatics projects. And I feel like this is just a little bit loud. Do you feel like it's a little bit loud? Okay, so let me just get, is that right? A little bit loud? Let me turn it down. Is that better? About right for the people under the projectors? Okay, thank you. So I've been working in an area, as Judy has um, described to you, uh, an area that we have come to call crisis informatics, which is a study of information and communication technology in relation to actual or potential mass emergencies with a particular focus on the role of social computing in such situations. Now today, social media is one large class of social computing technology, and its advance has brought major attention to the nature of large social movements, which include disaster response, although we don't often think of disaster as a large social movement. I've been working um, on developing this field for the past decade, uh, starting just after the December 24, 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, but before Hurricane Katrina that following August. So just to put you back in time a little bit, if you can remember where we were, technologically speaking, um, mobile, di mobile phone diffusion was finally high in the U.S. after lagging behind the rest of the world, but we still did not have pervasive data services. We were not texting here in the U.S. in 2004, 2005. The very first camera phones were making their appearance in the summer of 2005, but again, only outside the U U.S. You might remember the London 2 bombings when you might have seen your first camera phone images. Um, and the world over, there was very little in the way of social media in the way that the general public thinks of it today. And though we in information science and other and computer science, et cetera, were very familiar with the idea of CMC, the public didn't have a tangible understanding of what social media could eventually become. So the stage was set for significant change. And after having worked in the area of mobile telephony and social computing in what were known as everyday environments, including the work that I did here, um, I began to wonder what could be possible when there was a collective turn to a set of time and safety critical needs, right? Imagining what, do you ha what happens when you have mobile phones at your disposal, never mind the, the other things that were eventually to come. In what situation could the very idea of collaboration and collaborative technology, which is what I cared most about, be put to the test <laughs> more so than during the massive social disruptions of disaster events? So at that point, I began to work to find the conceptual, theoretical, and methodological connections between my home fields of computer science, computer-supported cooperative work, and social computing with what is a rich social science literature on collective action and social convergence in relation to disaster events. So what I'm going to do in this talk is formally outline the field of crisis informatics as I see it today. It's a very inductive kind of analysis that are, has arisen, in my view, from the work that's been done, from the research that's been done, and from the problems that we've encountered, um, both through practitioners and then as an abstracted research problem. Um, and it, it came about, as you might imagine, through lots of collaboration with lots of people, lots of wonderful people. Um, this is my little uh, collage of these people, and in, depending on what talk I'm, try, I'm trying to give, I might animate this differently because I have, I'm trying to show different eras and different ages uh, of the work moving in, different disciplinary connections moving in at the time. And so these faces are a bit uh, removed from you, except for a couple. You might know a few people here. But roughly speaking, at the top, we have um, faculty who have come in at different points in all this work 
work. Um, and below we have students who are in different relationships with many of these different faculty. Don't overread into this, I'm not a great graphic designer. Um, but what I'm trying to show you is that we've had a very interdisciplinary crew. In this group of people, you will see people from software engineering, computational linguistics, telecom policy, civil engineering, communication, environmental design, meteorology, and the social science of meteorology, which is a thing. Um, and we have lots of those people in Boulder working for some of our national labs. And so it's been a really great opportunity to have a very diverse way of thinking about these problems of disaster response. And you'll see your, one of your favorite people, Gloria Mark, up there. We worked with her. Um, and Brian Simon was working uh, with Gloria and with us. And there's some other folks that have come through Irvine who are also on this, um, on this picture. Um, but the diversity um, has been necessary, and uh, the disciplinary diversity. And then I would argue that that very disciplinary diversity also gives its, the area broad appeal in other ways in which we might talk about diversity, which I think has really been important in the world of computer science where until this new department at CU is where I've done all my professional work in a college of engineering in computer science. And so you, we really saw a lot of, I think, great synergies happening here that I'm proud of. Um, so together we've studied and published and researched uh, on the events listed here. We've collected data on countless others that I couldn't represent uh, since 2005. Um, but of course we publish across events and theorize about issues that aren't driven by events alone. We have produced over 70 papers, dissertations, and master's thesis in 10 years. And we have a commitment to making the work available to a wide audience, including a practitioner audience. And so it's through that large body of work, which I, of course, can't talk about in any kind of detail, that I have come up instead with this way of describing what I think the five branches, the five major trajectories through the crisis informatics space are. A lot of it has um, been work that we've done, but um, a lot of the things I'll be talking about have been populated, of course, by groups that have come in and now are working worldwide on these problems. So I'm trying to give you a broad survey, but through things that um, we understand best. So um, before I do that, I want to do one act of staging that I think is really important, because otherwise the questions start popping off and in people's heads, popping up in people's heads, because the examples I give um, can be counterpoint to some of the examples that you can think of. And the reason why I think that is, is because um, we must distinguish between the effects of what I call exogenous versus endogenous hazard agents. So our group at CU has worked across a range of hazards. Uh, and our biggest contribution in the end has been about examining social media behavior in relation to events with exogenous agents. That is, agents that cannot be apprehended, like a hurricane, like an earthquake, like a, a, a very large terrorist event where you really have no sense of where that agency is coming from. You wouldn't know what to pursue um, while you're reacting to the damage of the disaster. Um, this is a ju juxtaposition to endogenous agents, agents that are from within. Uh, which means that there is a perception that those agents can somehow be stopped. Often that behavior is criminal or perceived as criminal, but a pandemic might also interestingly be seen as an endogenous agent because the Ebola, Ebola virus is harbored within an individual. And so when you start looking at crowd work um, or set of individuals, you look at um, a different kind of set of problems that arise that the crowd orients to. So in all cases of crisis response, the online crowd is looking for the most salient problems to solve. When you have an endogenous agent like the Boston bombings, for example, um, the crowd there is largely characterized as one that was pursuing the perpetrators. And the crowd, as we know, got it wrong. I mean, terribly wrong, and it caused all sorts of, of damage. With endogenous agents, the system drives itself towards the social system, drives itself towards the apprehension and identification of individuals. The character of the interaction is quite different, and it drives towards issues of blame, justice, and even forensics, right? Kind of problem solving, sleuthing. Um, in the case of natural, natural hazards or hazards or other exogenous agents, there are lots of problems to solve. It is much more diffuse, a question and answer kind of situation. The questions aren't minor, but the crowd has many things to divide its attention, right? And so what happens is, is when you look at how the crowd, the crowd self-organizes online in response to the events, the social structures start looking really, really different. And so um, that's why you're going to see some differences here in the way I animate these five branches. Um, something I've had to say to um, my department when I was up for promotion and some other things, but also what I'll say to um, 
a general audience that says, well, you guys started in crisis informatics, I guess. Um, why don't you study this? And why don't you study school shootings? And why don't you study that? Um, I would say that you know, crisis informatics, if we can call it a field or a subfield, whatever you'd like to name it, it can and should address problems of war, bombings, pandemics, and so on, but we should make that a distinct requirement from the expectations of what one lab can do, or even, this is the critical part, what one paper can do. So in other words, just because all this behavior is occurring online when bad things happen to people, it doesn't mean that it's all the same kind of thing. And the problem is um, that we're seeing lots of singular interpretations if you say you're looking at crisis or you say you're looking at crisis informatics. And it's actually a very technologically deterministic view of things. I think because crisis informatics is being read by a wide audience of people far outside our disciplines that are informing it, it is actually being misread. And this is my current cause of concern after 10 years on, because readers don't understand this distinction. And even many, many authors do not understand this distinction. So they don't know how to write about this distinction. The core phenomena of interest is not social media. The core phenomena of interest are the different kinds of hazards. We should see different kinds of collective action and information seeking in relation to these different kinds of events, and we do. And this is one primary dimension along which I think we should divide them. So, um, so some of these arguments will make more sense when you see um, how I'm talking about these branches from an exogenous agent point of view. That's mostly where I'm driving this conversation. The branches still stand up if you talk about endogenous agents, but the way you animate them might be different. The branches themselves don't dictate what the results are. They are describing the lines of inquiry and the things you can do when you say you're interested in disaster response and online behavior. So, um, all right, so let me begin. So first, I'd like to talk about social compu computing as it's perceived in relation to professional emergency management and as it's perceived as a common um, uh, frame of reference that we think we all share and how that creates problems for how we then come to understand and what we can do with social media data. Then uh, the second line of research capitalizes on the spontaneous social media activity that naturally occurs in response to disasters. I'll talk about the challenges of collecting big crisis data, if you will, and how collection is already a kind of sampling decision at the point of collection that limits the kinds of things that can be done and asked of the data down the road. And then I'll uh, spend the most time summarizing um, the internal social structures that arise online in response to exogenous disaster agents. And finally, connecting back to branch one, um, how what happens, I'll talk about how what happens online is starting to have connections to emergency response activity in the physical world. So people are doing all these things online, doesn't have any bearing at all in what happens in terms of the offline, if you will, emergency response activity. So to keep track, um, I have each section color coded five colors for you, uh, because that's for you and for me, both of us, um, because I, there are themes that move across, and so at least we'll have some sense of where we are. Okay, so, Crisis informatics as a research field disrupts more comfortable frames of reference about who does what in disaster. So let me explain. When we consider technology solutions or impacts, we must expand our understanding to go beyond what formal responders need, perhaps say in terms of situational awareness, which is something you might have heard of, and recognize that, they, that the needs of the people on the ground who are victims of disaster are trying to do the very same thing. They're striving to figure out what to do. So this is in the aftermath of, the, of Hurricane Katrina, some weeks after, after people had been in shelters for quite a long time. Look at what they did here. They took one of the few walls in the huge Houston Astrodome to make a bulletin board for missing person flyers. There are no pictures. Remember, there were no camera phones. Many of these folks didn't have phones. If they did have phones, they couldn't charge them because they've been in these huge shelters with the lights turned on day after day, week after week, and not a lot of places to charge their phones. Um, and if, even if they had photos, they wouldn't have been able to print them. They didn't know they were going to need them. This bulletin board phenomena is totally typical. You see it across uh, disasters with a uh, high diaspora of people. Um, and in, certainly in the Katrina and then Rita event, which happened two weeks afterward, and shelters had to be moved because Rita was coming through, um, there were, in the end, 111 shelters spread across, official shelters, spread across the U.S. Gulf Coast region. So when they do things like this, all these pieces of paper and ripped off cardboard with missing persons saying, have you seen so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so could be in some shelter some hundred miles away, 
Um, they know it's the best they could do under the circumstances. It probably didn't work very well, but they were desperate, right? Um, it makes the point that absolutely everyone is striving under whatever circumstances they're in. They're striving for situational awareness. They're striving to solve their problems. It doesn't belong just to the formal response. Social media does two important things. First, it expands the audience. And this is an example of tweet reports after the 2011 uh, Japan uh, earthquake and tsunami from the personal person, Google Person Finder database um, that spits out each data um, base report as a tweet. And so it's the same behavior as the bulletin board behavior, but now, of course, there's potentially a global audience for such things. And then second, social media exposes the for informal work conducted by the public. Because many of us are trained in informatics, human-computer interaction, or CCW, we know that the very idea of informality is important to understanding real life. We think of Lucy Suchman and plans and situated action, where you think about that kind of informality. The idea is that what we say we will do, excuse me, do, does not reflect how things actually get done. This is important to keep in mind when we build technology, we know this, or when we build emergency management policy, which is the same kind of artifice. It's a construct built upon rationalized logic because it's so much easier to design for things about how we think they should be done than how they actually could be done. So we think about disasters, which we know aren't part of anybody's plan. We see here um, how informality comes into play, and we choose to ignore it in between disaster events when we set up policy to regulate how we're going to deal with the public doing the things that the public will do. So here in the 2002 earthquake in Turkey, I find this, you see the public directly assisting in rescue activities. And you can tell from their dress that you have a mix of formal and informal workers here. Um, uh, and you can see orderly, cooperative work done, even though it's clear, clearly improvised work, right? No one was planning for this. The lesson here is that we simply be willing to hear that informal roles and informal work exist and that they accomplish important things. And this is a really big message to emergency management, as you might understand. Such an understanding counteracts the myths of victimhood and other false depictions of public conduct and disasters, especially those with exogenous agents. Contrary to what you see in the movies, people are not panicked, they are not in a daze, they are not looting. These are things that get magnified hugely. If we continue to think about disasters as things that need to be policed because people are perceived as helpless and then somehow dangerous because of their helplessness, then we aren't, first of all, doing a humane job in responding to the disaster. And then second, all this energy about what we think the problems are are being misplaced. We actually don't know what the problems are at all. We think about disaster even though we keep thinking, we see them in the movies, we must know how it must be. If you've ever been in a disaster event yourself, you will know this. Terrible things can be happening around you, but you, if you are not an injured victim, and maybe even if you are, you are still assessing a situation. You're still making decisions. You're still trying to find your lost person, right? You might be distraught, but you still have your brain. And you never stopped acting based on, you're always acting based on your ongoing analysis of what's going on around you. You never stop being smart. So here's my long point. If we believe the movie version of disaster, we then bring those ideas to the social media front as well. It's another place of social convergence. We then magnify the problems that we must imagine be existing in that social media space, and the more we do that, the more we are distracted by the, quote, bad information and the bad actors that we actually aren't characterizing very well in the first place because we're willing to do that. And the more likely it is that we're missing this fascinating stuff, this kind of activity that's happening online. So it's these frames of reference that we need to disrupt and rebuild when we do our work, including with emergency managers. Even though emergency managers themselves know that work is highly improvised. In between events, there seems to be a, rever a reversion back to policy, right? Let's make things this way so that we can control these things that are happening underneath us. Let's control social media. So um, there's a lot of doubt within, within the emergency manager world about the value of social media information. Um, and the communication that ensues. And when there isn't doubt, there's certainly anxiety about how to do it well. And there are many factors to talk about here, including how emergency management is locking down too soon, what are be so-called best practices, um, because I think what will fundamentally change how emergency management will deal with the informal work of the public can be boiled down to one takeaway point, 
and that is this. That changes in policy and social, that changes in social media policy will come about through changes in local practice. And I'm going to illustrate this with a four tweet excerpt that I think will surely convince you from um, the 2012 Hurricane Sandy. So this is the start of a four tweet excerpt. Um, it's, this is a tweet from the Fire Department of New York and they are tweeting out as the hurricane is rolling in and this is at 9.32 in case you can't see the timestamp and except for some anonymizing of some things, these are exact tweets. So FDNY says, please note, do not tweet emergency calls. Please call 911. If it's not an emergency, please call 311. And then there are some hashtags. And by the way, hashtags were born out of disaster, and specifically the 2007 Southern California wildfires, which some of you might have lived through. We credit the invention of hashtags to Chris Messina, and that have, then, of course, has become instantiated and part of the design of Twitter and other third-party clients that support tweeting. Um, but they were an invention of disaster, which is another kind of theme that underruns all this uh, talk. Okay, so um, then we have a, a tweet from um, somebody named DYNB, and he says he's tweeting directly to FDNY and says, my sister's family at this address uh, has water rising 12 feet, need help, here's the phone number, first floor drowned, kids scared. Okay, so then FDNY writes back four minutes later, but not even, just about 45 minutes after the first declaration about how they were going to behave on Twitter, and FDNY says, Please keep to DYNB. Please to keep trying to call 911, period. I will try to reach dispatchers now. So they're already making a concession about what the policy is in relation to the practice. And then many tweets go by. FDNY is handling a lot of communications. And not even three hours after the event, um, they're writing to a series of people and says, don't want New York City to rely on this as an alternative to 911, period, but now we have a but, notifying dispatchers of all emergencies tweeted. Right. So this is the kind of thing, this is, this is this policy practice, policy situated action thing that we see always tied up in how emergency manager, managers are trying to solve their problem, what we encounter when we're trying to assist them, say, through action research about how they're going to make gains in this space. This is exactly what we see over and over again. OK, branch two. Um, it is the biggest point of entry into the crisis informatics space. This is a popular area. It attracts a lot of data scientists of different kinds to the fold because there are lots and lots of data to, that you can examine in lots of different ways. So um, the problem is, is that even the best data scientists are having trouble with resolving the two major constraints for good data derivation of social media data. And that's the optimi optimization for speed and the optimization for comprehensiveness. The holy grail is trying to achieve both at the same time. This is a whole field achievement. I doubt very much there'll be one lab or one person that solves this problem. Um, the reason it's hard is because, well, it's hard to do. There's a lot of data. But the reason why you have to have both, if you're truly going to use social media to help in disaster response, is if you're deriving data fast, you can be sure that it's not comprehensive. And if you're making decisions about where you're putting limited resources, which is what defines disasters, you don't have enough resources to cover an emergency, then you can bet that you've got problems here and you've got all sorts of ethical problems that's built on top of such decisions. So until we resolve that, it's very hard to use social media to decide how you're going to act situationally in a large disaster. <coughs> So in the meantime, we ask ourselves as a lab, well, we can derive, we can do one or the other. It's actually hard to do. We can do comprehensive, but then we're like two years too late. And we can do fast, but then we're not comprehensive, of course. And so um, we said, OK, well, what can we do? Is there something that can happen by deriving data fast that's still helpful to the emergency response? It doesn't incur these ethical dilemmas and problems of liability. And so we started working with civil engineers. Um, and uh, both in the Department of Transportation and at CU, um, and actually we, we got involved with GEAR teams, Geotechnical Extreme Events Reconnaissance Teams, which are funded by the NSF, and they are a network of geotechnicians around the world that form teams to deploy, to go out to disasters, to study the impacts of hazards on critical infrastructure naturalistically. So their goals are to use the world as their laboratory so they can get truly accurate portrayals of hazard load, water load, for example, on the environment. It's something they can't simulate well, or it's very expensive to simulate. 
But the, mobiliz the mobilization of these international teams is challenging, it's expensive, it can be dangerous, um, depending on the situation, um, and it's so easy to get it wrong. If you get your team together fast enough and they deploy to Japan, to Tokyo, because they're going to study the earthquake there, and they want to look at soil liquefaction, which is right where soils start liquefying, and that's where you see all the um, building um, destruction. Well, these are very localized kinds of things. Where along a 600 kilometer fault line do you go to go see liquefaction and what it's done? How do you deploy a team of five to do that well? So our idea was to use social media to help teams navigate within a highly diffuse um, area to, to figure out where to go and then um, to be able to look at the problems if they could look at them as they're occurring, certainly look at them after they're occurring, and then marrying the different social media reports with what can be done. So we were able to tackle this during our own floods in 2013. So one of the challenges in doing disaster response is that sometimes you just have to be there in order to do it well and to look at what's happening on the ground. So um, the Colorado Front Range experienced a major um, set of, uh, actually flash flooding is the best way to describe it in, in September 2013. We had what's known as a thousand year storm. We had one year of annual, one year of rainfall in four days. And so there was just water everywhere, even in, in outside the floodplain. And this, this is actually, there's, a, there's normally a creek just on the side of this bike trail. The whole thing now is a creek, as it probably always wanted it to be. Um, and this shows, for example, the kind of destruction that comes just even after a lot of high water load after a couple of days. And this is the kind of thing that geotechnicians are interested in, or people who are interested in rebuilding as quickly as they can the infrastructure, right? They want to know where these things are. And this becomes a very valuable piece of information for thinking about how to build such structures next to creeks in the future, if you do that at all. Um, so we rapidly extracted videos and photos and overlaid those with data, with our, the floodplain data. We had people on the ground in our area. We knew the area well, which is really important for understanding the geography. Um, when we had satellite imagery, when the clouds lifted, we um, married, we mashed up that data as well. Um, and this is kind of, this shows you some of the things you can do beyond the data, the social media data itself, and to produce other data. So here we have these open circles, um, which are bridges that were, had confirmed flooding. We know that from the satellite imagery, and we were able to confirm that flooding. And then these three dots are tweets that were geolocated and had photos with them. So what was great about this is that we could identify that Twitterer who was producing those photos. And we weren't just using that data, we could then identify that Twitterer and talk to him and say, do you have other photos? And you seem to live in the area. And then we're able to get data without putting additional people in harm's way. So one of the problems with disaster response is that it's not like citizen <coughs> science. If you ask people to say, what's happening at 6th and Main? you're gonna have people go to 6th and Main. And if there's a problem there, you just created a new problem for yourself, right? So it's really hard to treat this kind of work in a citizen science kind of way. We have to use data in an unsolicited kind of way, unless we already know that there are people there. So this is a way to kind of dig through how the data means something to us as a visual report or a textual report or a metadata report, but then we can also pursue that person and do other kinds of things with them. So that just gives you a sense of the possibilities of what you can do, even if you have the limits that the field is currently facing in terms of state of the art. But building up solutions to attain that broad situational awareness from social media, that remains the holy grail. And this is only hard because tweets, as you might know, are not by and large individually contentful, right? Just on their own. They exist, but they're hard to find. So what I'm going to do now is show you the perfect tweet, and then I'm going to show you a more realistic tweet, and what I'm going to tell you is that they're both relevant in their context. They both communicate <coughs> information about the disaster that could be valuable if you only knew it was about the disaster. So here's the perfect self-contained tweet. Okay, so this is Jane tweet. We get the timestamp for free. This is during the Red River floods of 2008. Here, she offers a twit pic, so she's, this is kind of all early days in Twitter, so she's quite advanced in how she's thinking about how a tweet could be useful. She offers a picture, presumably of the Red River. She says it's the Red River in Winnipeg, because uh, it's a long river, so she's telling us where it is. She's giving us a precise location. We don't have geolocation <coughs> in this tweet, or I don't think there's much geolocation at the time, actually. So she's giving it textually. So she says this is north of the University of Manitoba, behind the law building and the U College, and then she gives us a date. So this date is important. You might wonder why, because we have a date with a timestamp. But she, this is what I think she thinks. 
she knows, she's doing recipient design. She's providing a piece of data, <coughs> visual, location, and the time. Just because she tweets it at that time, she's hope, it doesn't mean it's going to be marked as that time. She, she knows it might be retweeted, it might be shared, it might be diffused across other networks or used by emergency managers or people who need information. So this is a really thoughtful person who's doing recipient design. Alas, most data do not look like this. Um, and even when it's perfect, it's hard, you know, we and others are using machine learning classifiers, some, a little bit of topic modeling, increasingly some human computation, using microtaskers to help mark up the data. But even with perfect tweets, it's difficult. Um, the, the numbers are mounting every day. There are evolving styles of communication. Gloria and I encounter blogs that have multiple languages, even within a long, the long, the quote, long text of a blog, and it's very hard to declare what that language is, never mind a tweet. Um, and then distinguishing be between retweets is difficult. So on the planet every day, you might not know this, but there are lots and uh, lots and lots of earthquakes that are felt by the human population. And when you have 40 a day, and maybe you have 11 that are felt by the human population around the world, that's pretty frequent. And so the retweets of one <coughs> earthquake soon become entangled with the retweets of another earthquake. So um, this becomes really difficult. Um, I think, I think you can believe me on that. So, so then, then let's just make this a little harder, because I'm going to lead uh, up to the point of why we have to look at data not just linguistically, and we have to create new forms of data collection. So I showed you the world's most perfect tweet, but here's a more typical one. Also, I can tell you, in hindsight, about the disaster. <laughs> totally typical. <laughs> So it's funny, but it's a, it turns out it's a great tweet. So whatever thought you have in your mind, hold it in your mind, because I'm going to come back to this as an example as I talk about branch three, how we collect data. So how we collect data gets us to the point of saying, oh, you know what, that was a Hurricane Sandy tweet, because remember, look, there's nothing in it that would say it was about Hurricane Sandy, right? So how we collected it got us to the point to say, ah, oh, that's about Hurricane Sandy. The problem is, is that most research in this area doesn't collect it right, so you'll never get that kind of tweet. And if you did, you have to figure out what you're going to do with it. Okay, so, um, so the next slide is the most profound result of all the research over 10 years that we've done. Most profound result. Are you ready? Get ready. Write it down. <laughs> Social media is conversational. <laughs> okay, you know this, but here is what you might not have thought about as the consequence. Why is so much research in crisis informatics and in social computing in general, they treat data as though it is not. They don't even treat data as though it's part of a monologue, right? So we would never do this in person. We would never walk by a conversation in the hall and take out one sentence that somebody says in a, you know, and somehow think that's representative of really much of anything. On a good day, we wouldn't do that, right? So the question is, why is this happening with human computation tasks and machine learning tasks? Um, and it seems especially Twitter. So we go back to this tweet. And you, you, um, whether you're a machine or a human trying to say, ask the typical questions, which is these are the questions that are usually asked. Is this on topic or off topic? I don't know. Is it relevant to what? I don't know. Is it truthful? Is it truthful? Was there a deer flying in the sky? <laughs> you know, probably. You know, I don't know. So these are just impossible questions because they're impossible because there's so much going on before and after such a claim. So when we were starting to look, we so we had these flaws in our work for a while, and now we're really trying to look at minimally um, in the tweet space uh, at as monologue. So here I'm going to show you an excerpt of this same person who says there's a deer flying in the sky, and let's lead up to that point in the tweet and how it suddenly has meaning. And I'll read this out for the those in the back. Um, so uh, um, I'm giving you all the data except for the timestamp and the username here, which I decided wasn't relevant. But the content is precisely the same, OK? So we are approaching, we have a project that looks at protect, what is called protective decision making in disasters. So we want to know, because the world doesn't know this very well, how is it that people, when they're facing any kind of hazard, but in this case, coastal <laughs> hazards, how is it they assess risk? How is it, 
when is it that they have enough information to say, I'm going to do something, especially if they've had hurricanes come before and before and before. Um, when do they take action? And action might either be an evacuation, but it also can be a conscious decision to shelter in place, or it can be a decision to um, buy supplies, for example. That's a, that's a protective action. Or to gas up your car, that can be another protective action. Check the transportation um, subway lines to see if they're going to close in New York. That would be another protective action. Okay, so he starts out by telling us people are really overreacting about this damn hurricane. So he's not, he doesn't think he's at risk, we would think. Then he says, I'm about to put my iPhone on the charger. Now, if you were to get that tweet alone, you couldn't judge if that had anything to do about the hurricane at all. You wouldn't know. In relation to that other one, it's hard to know what that might mean, right? You, you can't really yet say, I would argue. Then we have our deer flying in the sky tweet, but it is very close to Halloween. So we don't know, and there's a lot of, how, there's a lot of uh, hurricane parties, which is another coping mechanism, actually, in disaster response. So there's hurricane parties. They were all going to have Halloween parties. They have all their booze. We have a lot of talk about booze in, during Hurricane Sandy. Um, so, so we're starting to see this tweet. We don't quite know what it means yet, I would argue. Again, if, and remember, if you especially saw it on your own. But now with this fourth tweet, in um, line with the others, we're starting to make sense of this. So now he says, I'm about to make something to eat before the power goes out. And that seems like the big clue. Power might go out. The deer flying in the sky is a weather tweet. And then the one before, the iPhone on the charger, I would argue, is resolved as well, right? He's thinking about the power might go out. But then we see where the decision happened. If we, in, uh, where we have the data, we have the timestamp here. We know that somewhere in between, people are overreacting. And I'm going to put the iPhone on the charger. That was a protective decision where he's starting to hedge and wonder what's going on. This goes on. He's another tweet. I have it in pink because this is the only one we would have picked up if we did the classic way of collecting data for disasters because of the hashtags. Not just because of the hashtags. In this case, it is only hashtags. But if Hurricane Sandy was in here without the hashtag or a particular place, maybe we would have picked it up as well. But here he's writing to Governor Christie, which is kind of funny. He's writing to the governor. And there's no sense of agency here. Um, he says, when is it safe again? When is it safe again to head back home? And what's, what's funny about this is that this still doesn't tell us very much about protective decision making because it's, there's no sense of agency. We don't know if he's acting on, on his own or on behalf of others because he, he's not talking about himself here. But then, so we finally hear, it feels so great to be home, sigh. So now we have an evacuation behavior that we, we couldn't know from any of this. So we see this progression of, of a, a great deal of protective decision making coming about when we look at the whole thing as a monologue. And then the second point is we only would have gotten this from this person and we never would have known the rest of this. So you can't look at these kinds of problems unless you look at the whole thing. So why do we, data scientists, computer scientists, and even information scientists who are supposed to know better, ignore the larger communicative context? And it's this tyranny of the data structure that I think is driving this. And it's compromising research design, and I think it's compromising it in a lot of social computing research. Um, but to collect in a way that supports the analysis that I'm implying needs to be done, where you collect all this communicative context, there are, of course, consequences. The data collection become huge. You never know if you have the right thing. Um, and if we choose to collect for context, the data just explode on us. So let me show you what happens um, as soon as you do this. And this is just an impressionistic example of, of, what, of what I'm talking about. So let's say you're collecting on Hurricane Sandy and you get all these tweets, each of these dots is a tweet. Um, and you know they're from these different users and you say, okay, I found a user. And so what we do, the reason why we found our deer flying in the sky guy is because he appeared once or twice and then we went and caught, collected what we call as contextual streams. It's a second round call. But then you do this for everybody. Everybody, everybody, everybody. And you got a lot of data, right? Really fast. And it becomes messy. So you got a lot of data, you have to deal with it, first of all, in terms of storage and management and filtering. But then you've got to say, well, what the heck does it mean? But um, we would have missed, we wouldn't have known what it really meant to evacuate if all we did was to look at the pink tweets. Nor would we have understood that there's all this social interaction that I'm just implying here through this crossover, that there's all these social structures and things that are underpinning how people decide to spread information about, you know, you really should, you really should evacuate right now. This would be really good if you did that. And we lose all that knowledge about how that happens and looking at that then qualitatively to say what's interesting about that. So even looking at the monologue treatment becomes valuable.
So again, if you only get that, you've got a problem. So um, because the data become too big to analyze only linguistically then, you have to find new techniques for sampling data. Um, and one of the things that we're working on right now is trying to find the right kinds of people and then looking at their, the language that they're saying. So we find the people through certain situations and so we look at what they do and then we look at what they say. So for example, um, and this, some of this work has been published and it's here. So the follower Delta's work was um, by Kate Starbird, Grace, Grace Muzni, and myself. Um, we found that the follower Deltas, and this was way back now in 2012, we were looking at some event in 2010, 2011. Um, the follower Deltas, the increase, the, the greater the Delta, the more likely somebody was going to be on the ground and able to give eyewitness reports. So a lot of the interest is looking at people who have high followers to start with, as they're, though they're somehow important to a disaster event. But you can have people who have very few followers, often zero, <coughs> out. but if you look for their delta, that's a person you should be following, and that's a person whose social network you should be grabbing, and that's the way you should collect the data if you want to know who has influence and how information is diffusing. So looking at things like that is important. Pacing, we think, is important. So. Um, uh, let's just take tweeting for example again. If you tweet a lot and then suddenly you're not tweeting, that's probably not a good sign. If you don't tweet very much and then suddenly you're tweeting a lot when a disaster hits, that's a different kind of sign. But it means something, right? And often people will adopt these technologies because they're desperate, like the bulletin boards, to create new information. Um, so we're looking at these variances in pacing to see are those people we should be looking at and then we should be grabbing all the tweets that touch their social network and of course how far out. Um, we're looking at geotagging switching. So if people turn geotagging on and off consciously, is that something that tells us about um, somebody um, who's acting in relation to the disaster event? And then we're doing things around movement derivation. I'm going to skip over that in the, um, in the, in the uh, given the time. So, but just to say, we're looking at the geotechnical, the, the geo movements to s decide if somebody's evacuating or staying in place, and then looking at their activity to kind of confirm or deny or elaborate what that means. All right, another lesson we have learned um, is to beware the lure of bad information. This goes back to this whole framing startup that I gave you in the beginning about how people are um, mythically portrayed disasters, and so there's a lot of work around. I'm gonna find the bad actors, I'm gonna find the bad information, and this is in data science in general when they say, aha, let's study Hurricane Sandy. Um, and this is especially true in hazards with exogenous agents. It's a total red herring, I think it's a total distraction. I think there's bad information out there. I think there are bad actors out there. But I think of all the hard problems, it's the very easiest of the hard problems we have. And in fact, 75% of the basic research that is happening on that should be moved over into these two problems, which keep me up, keep me up at night. And that's the hyperlocality and hypertemporality of data, of social media data. So what's true for me might not be true for you, and you're a half a mile away, right? So it just, and so if you can't say it's bad information, it's totally good information, but it's not good for you, it's good for me. Same with time. Time one, it's true, time two, it's not, and time three, it might be true again. How do you know when, and how, it's the relevance of data that is, um, to, that is really the important thing. And that goes, again, back to these myths of victimhood, that we're making far too salient a problem, this idea of the bad actor in exogenous agents. Okay, branch four. And these go, start going quickly, so we'll finish, Judy. <laughs> okay, so branch four has to do with how the social structures arise from the primordial soup of social media. So we've come to understand this through our research by looking at different units of analysis from interpersonal to group to organization to institution. And I just walk you through some visuals. I worked at 1.1 hard to develop. I hope you like them. Anyway, so it begins with people sharing information, asking questions. Do you know if Walgreens is still open? Because I got to find a generator. Or where can I, um, where can I get gas? Where are the lines the shortest? Um, and that's one level of analysis. Like who's saying what to whom, and what are they saying? Um, then what happens is you start seeing people work together on and through the data that are produced by themselves and other people. So data, the social media conversations, become sites of production themselves. People start operating on that and they say, you know what, I heard the Walgreens is closed, you should really go to that one. Um, or they're saying, I heard this shelter is open and takes dogs, and I heard that one is too. You know what, let me compile a list and, and send that out to folks who want to know. So they start, these data become sites of production, you start seeing this group level interaction. Um, and then sometimes these grassroots 
groups for me. They do that example of that task I just said, but just kind of amp it up on steroids a little bit. This completely parallels what happens in the physical space when people go and say, you know, I wonder if I can go, I wonder what's going on down there in Southern California with the wildfires. I'm going to go down with my shovel and some gloves and, you know, maybe I can help while I'm down there. And they find something to do. And then they start finding other people that they can do those things with. And then they start doing things like clearing debris um, or whatever it might be. Um, this is very typical of the whole history of disaster that we know about. But this becomes organizational level analysis. And then as these coalitions form, sometimes they persist across disasters. And then we start seeing shifts in the information relationships between the whole institution of emergency management, which is why we care about then, going back to point one, how is an emergency management responding to these changes that are happening tweet to tweet? There's, there's a connection, and so we're trying to make those. So let me just give you an example of that middle layer of this um, people who mobilize and create groups and do things for the long after sometimes of disaster. So um, this comes from uh, work uh, led by Kate Starbird in, um, we were looked at the uh, online response in Haiti and we found a gr grassroots activist group. Um, and this is a, 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 an email interview question we gave to them, and this person describes it really well. So she says, in the beginning I worked alone, I got onto Twitter, I started recognizing people who seemed to have good information, and we would support each other, we'd retweet each other, and we'd help to find information for each other. And then another person in that group, not eight days after the earthquake, tweets and says, I'm stunned, I've gotten supplies in, saved people from the rubble, brought them doctors, we have best team, we are voluntweeters. And then they go on to call themselves voluntweeters, um, and then, four months after the Haiti earthquake, they formalize, they incorporate as a nonprofit, they become Humanity Road, um, they teach people how to crisis tweet, which was a really big deal in 2010, um, and they are one of not an infinite number, but you know, a large, finite number of groups that started developing really what was a cottage industry that arose from all of this since Haiti. We saw the same thing happen with OpenStreetMap, which you might know is the Wikipedia of geospatial data um, and this is what the it was very underrepresented Haiti was very this poor prince was very underrepresented the day before the earthquake on the open street map data 446 mappers 21 days later actually no actually more like a um, 520 something um, if you this this screen doesn't resolve it really well but there's they're populating all of this with data that they get from it's armchair mapping they have some from satellite and aerial imagery and these maps were really useful to the UN log base, logistics base, because many of the government buildings and many of the government officials were killed, destroyed, um, and the data was, uh, map data was already imperfect. And so this was actually quite helpful for them. They did the same thing at many events in between. The next major event that we looked at um, empirically was Hurricane Yolanda, um, uh, so nearly four years later. And you can see that even in the Philippines where there was already an active OSM community, there's still actually a lot of mapping to be done. They come in and map just like this again. And then when we compare um, the two events together, this is just to give you a sense. I hope you can see the coloration enough. This is Port-au-Prince. This is Tacloban, which is where most of the work was. We're zoomed in here. Um, and the number of edits is the same across both. And that's why we chose this particular um, resolution on each of these. But here you can see there's a scatter of user activity. And here you can start seeing that the information, that the user activity is much more clustered. So then we look at inst organizationally, institutionally, you're seeing that people are becoming better crisis mappers. They're learning how to do it. And so, and that's, what, and, that, and the organization is instituting that as part of what they do. So, um, so one of the things that we're doing increasingly is working on OpenStreetMap. One of the challenges with OpenStreetMap, unlike Wikipedia, is you can't see into the data like you can with Wikipedia, where you have history pages and talk pages, and you can do all sorts of analyses on who's editing what and when, who, who are the, you know, um, the most active users, who are the newbies, how are they being brought in, is it a community of practice, all these kinds of things. You can't ask it easily of the OSM data because of the way it's represented. So one of the things that we're doing, and this is um, being led by Ken Anderson on a grant that we just got, um, we're building a data analytics platform to be able to see that kind of data and talk more about these very kind of patterns in a number of different ways. And we've already deployed a primitive version of that in Nepal. And then just a couple more minutes to talk about branch five. What are the online and offline connections? Is there any relevance of what's happening on the ground? Um, the short answer is yes. So, so I, I guess I say, I bring this up because this has been a major criticism of our work. Um, over the years. Like you're dwelling on all this online activity, how do you know there's any relevance to what's happening on the ground? You know, is it just 
people thinking that they're helping and having fun and there's nothing nothing going on. Um, and you know, the truth is, it's really hard to show what those connections are because in part you have to be there to see the connections, right? And to see them happening and make the mappings. Disasters happen over diffuse areas. Even with the Colorado floods, if you've ever been to Boulder, it's not a very big place. But to, I mean, just to have even a sense of what's happening in all those places because, you know, the whole thing is in a state of emergence. You just can't know where to look for all these things, which is why we want to help the teams find that soil liquefaction on that one point along a 600 kilometer line. Um, so it's hard to witness, therefore it's hard to study in any kind of way that's not anecdotal. The flood events made that possible for us. Um, but also I would say it's really our responsibility as researchers in this place to create those opportunities. So not to see it and not to create disaster, but to say, okay, I see all this stuff happening online. Can, is there a design intervention to be done here that would help make this connection? And this is where the both summative goals of our research and the formative goals of our research come into play. I'm just gonna touch on a couple of examples. This is also following the floods. We did some uh, work and in, in work led by my recently graduated student, Joanne White. Um, we discovered a community of practice around ranching that comprised of people who didn't know each other. And what they, they found, uh, they saw a person who was um, calling for help because she had 38 of her show horses who were literally marooned on a mountaintop after the floods. You can be marooned when all the road access is gone. You don't have to be surrounded by water. It's just that you can't get out. That's what it means to be marooned. So we have 38 horses who are marooned on a mountaintop in September. It's wet and cold. The, water, the, 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 the earth is sodden. Winter rolls in at 9,000 feet really early, right? So it became a problem to figure out how are they going to get these horses down and where are they going to put them? And how do you move 38 horses? That's really hard when all the canyon roads are closed. So we did a, a, a study that looked at um, uh, uh, how this coalition of people came together online, how they did their work offline, and it's not just interesting that it happened offline and online. It's more of how there was some interesting hyperbole um, some around the problem when it was expressed online, and then how once it eventually, a month later, migrated to the offline activity, how they started tempering um, and bringing their expertise into, into managing the problem, the materiality of the work of being a rancher, kind of managed the problem um, and, and made the expertise work around a group of people who didn't know each other, who came from many states to move these show horses down off the mountain in their own equipment. Um, we've developed a crowd tasking environment to help with lost and found tasks and disaster. We're focusing on pet displacement, um, which might seem like a toy problem, but it's a really big problem. Um, the low estimates of the number of pets who were um, displaced from their families after Katrina, the low estimate was 70,000. Right, so, and people couldn't retrieve their pets and then it became a public health issue. Potentially, um, they had to take care of these animals in 100 degree plus weather. It becomes a huge tax on the system, um, not to mention, uh, and to mention a very emotional problem. So what's great about it as a problem though, is that this is a place where people can enter into the scene and help and not incur any liability. And it's actually additionally helpful because we don't have a way of doing that very well right now. So it's so we're trying to think of crowd tasking problems that don't interfere and can lay on top in a helpful way on emergency response. And then uh, we support practitioners in the state of Colorado and throughout the American West. Um, we have two students who deploy on disasters throughout the American West. Um, and increasingly we're working on this idea of resilient infrastructures. Had a nice talk with um, uh, Matt about this um, idea of information infrastructures and how cities can become more resilient, not just to sudden shocks, but chronic stressors um, as we face increasing problems with climate change and population housing and food supply and that kind of thing. So we're really trying to um, uh, find these gateways for coordinating with partners in emergency management and doing applied research that has basic research outcomes. So those are the five branches of crisis informatics. Stay tuned for more. I'll come back in another 17 years. <laughs> five, five other ones. Um, I'll just close by saying, as you can see, disasters are sites of human innovation. Victims are creative. Helpers are creative. Responders are creative. And researchers, too, must be creative and vigilant and respectful and disciplinary integrative of all the things that we know. And that's the promise of where the solutions are and where, um, where the excitement and, the, and the, the energy to keep doing this lies. So thank you very much for your attention. Three minutes.
53. <laughs> Gordon. So thank you for a wonderful, fascinating talk. So you showed us the difference between the perfect tweet and the reality of tweets that happen. Have you thought about uh, trying to set guidelines for people during disasters so that they can be encouraged to tweet the perfect tweet? So a little bit. So um, so this was work that Kate Starbird would, did with the tweet the tweak tweak the tweet syntax mm -hmm. was was to use that just a very simple hash hashtag based syntax that had where the hashtag um, defined the field of what was to follow. So you need something at this location. Blah 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 blah. So there's some interesting traction you can get there. The, the, So not, I would argue that not everyone needs, should tweet the same way. So when you have people on the ground, it's unlikely that they're going to, um, not just because they're in a panic, but they're, they're experiencing the disaster as they're experiencing it. One of the things you might want to know is if there's a sense of fear or whatever. So sometimes the naturalistic stuff is very helpful to see what is truly kind of the tempo emotionally, the tempo in terms of the perceived risk, what is, what is really happening there. Then you have people on the outside who, so I'm not sure I know the answer because I've been asked by journalists to make this claim that people should tweet in a particular way and I've resisted it because I think the naturalistic stuff, if we can understand it better, reveals so much more about the true state of affairs, like who is truly affected and how they're affected. But what we find is that those invested volunteers through uh, Humanity Road, through the virtual operations support team, which is in a big experiment with the US Forest Service, those people who are outside, but aware enough of what's going on to be able to tweet accurate information, because the further out you are, the harder it is to really know the geography of a space. So it's a very special population of people who have enough local information to know that it's accurate and make it locally meaningful, who have the resources to be able to marry up all those pieces of information to say, and here's your perfect tweet. So a small set of people can do that. And in the meantime, we have to figure out how to do it with the naturalistic stuff, because I think it expresses the human condition better. Uh, yes, and then Matt. OK. Uh, also, I want to add, I thought it was a fascinating presentation, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, the question that I have is on, um, uh, I guess, in the policy uh, space, where uh, one of the things that used to happen when there'd be you know, disasters, at least in the U.S., is how AT&T, the long distance service provider, responds. Uh, and they have policies that say, if we have an earthquake in Irvine, block incoming calls, prioritize outgoing calls. Because, mm -hmm. of course, you know, you have remote family members who's like, oh my gosh, I heard there was an earthquake. Sure. Everybody calls in, which saturates and effectively yeah. shuts down the system because everybody's mm -hmm. trying to find whomever. Yeah. Uh, and so they found that they had to, by just doing that, they actually could do more help. So in the same regard, mm. do you have any insights as to what might be useful with regard to uh, either guidance for Twitter or for like social media users, whether it's Twitter or Vine or whatever, or for even the operators themselves, Twitter Corporation and the like, to okay. try to yeah. Ameliorate so, the saturation. So it's so funny because it depends on who is looking at the social media communications, right? So when you have researchers looking at the communications, you might want, you might not want to affect the behavior at all because you want to see it. Or if you're a researcher, you might want to say, would you please stop using the Hurricane Sandy tweet to say you're going to pray about this thing because I'm trying to figure out what's happening on the ground in Hurricane Sandy, right? So this becomes hard to kind of dictate, right? Because people want to pray and they want to offer emotional. So, but as researchers you say, well, that's really interesting if I want to study religiosity in the US around that problem, that would be really interesting. But if I really want to study situational awareness, then I really wish you would treat, tweet that. So it really becomes hard to say you're going to sift this out because it depends on what you're looking for and what you care about. If you're an emergency manager, they're looking for things that, are, that go to situational awareness, that go to tactical decisions that are right there, like who is truly in need of help. A pr a pr always one more problem, and I just feel like I just raised problems, but the problem is, is it's, it's also what is not tweeted. So 
one of the things around the comprehensivity problem is that you've got to look at what isn't being expressed. Is it not being expressed because you don't have power? Is it not being expressed like power, this kind of power? Is it not being expressed because you don't have, um, because you're injured? Is it not being expressed because you don't actually have social power? You actually don't have a cell phone. Uh, you don't have a social network that you can call out to or you know is calling into you that you can say, I know you're in Pittsburgh. I'm in Irvine. I can't get a hold of 911. Would you please tweet out for me what's going on here? Which is what happens. A lot of the tweeting that you catch, catch is not by people who are on the ground. It's by this proxy activity of people who have gotten hold through radio, um, through email, through cell phone, uh, voice communications, and they are tweeting out sometimes very far away. And of course, it's those who are privileged who often have those very large social networks and can do that. So I'm not answering your question at all, but I just don't think there's a straight up answer because it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, I would say that I just think we're not very, in terms, I'm pleased that emergency management is looking at the problem of social media, but I think the social media tools as they exist now actually don't help emergency managers as well as we hope that, that they could. Um, and what they are doing, though, is they are attending to what's happening, and they can't officially, um, without the approval of the commander, insert new information. But what they can do is when they see something anomalous, they can correct that. And that is where the practice is going, and I think that is a really powerful change. And so if we can filter things for them to help them see what the people think the messages are, then they can act in terms of a corrective fashion, otherwise let it go. Because if it's accurate, they actually want the public to know, even though they can't officially maybe say at that point that that is accurate information. So I think that's the trick, is to filter it for them so they can respond to the inaccuracies. Yes? Um, this is great. Thank you. And I love what you were saying about the, the, the tyranny of the data structures or that, that idea. Um, I'm wondering if you have done any comparison across different forms of social media? Does a disaster look differently on Twitter than it does in Facebook or in Tinder? Or, you know, or yeah. Wikiak? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, and both does it look different, but also do those allow different kinds of work to be done within the design? So, what I, so we did something really systematic on this with the um, flooding that occurred in our area in Jefferson County, which is just south of Boulder County, which was affected enough but not devastated that we could get into the sheriff's office. So we, one of my students was plugged in and um, a participant observer with the sheriff's office activities there. It was harder to get into the offices in other counties. But there was enough damage there. And we look at, we see these layers of interaction, how they evolve, their use of blog posts, tweets, and Facebook, actually. And um, so there's kind of a layering effect of what happens there. So. Um, uh, what you see, of course, on Facebook is, um, so there's this idea before dis all this tech of the altruistic community that arises after disaster, where communities come together, neighborhoods come together, and they're more altruistic than you've ever seen before, right? Even in, in cultures, perhaps, that don't um, foster volunteerism because they have lots of social welfare support. So you see this, uh, this is culturally true, uh, uh, universally true. Um, the problem is, is that we used to talk about seeing altruistic behavior online and therefore people wouldn't sort of um, take advantage of each other. But if it's very, very public, you can't talk about the altruistic community because it relies on it being small and contained. So when neighborhoods are really effective or when sheriff departments, for example, are really effective is if they have closed groups that reflect, like echo the geographical community in a virtual way, which I mean, it sounds so simple, but it really that the boundedness of the geography allows for the altruism to happen, so people can share things like addresses, right? And so, it's, and and say, I'm at this, I live at this address, I can't get home. Could you please go check this for me? And they might even start saying things like, "This is how you can get into the house," and that kind of thing. They can only do that if they can close the communication. So, what we're finding, and what I didn't get to very well, and I apologize on the horse problem was that what's wonderful is when you can state a problem, cast a wide net for expertise, capture that expertise or the geographical proximity, proximity but also the kind of expertise, and then close it back up again. Because then you get people that you can, that you, odds are, odds are, it's safe, and you can start volunteering information about your horses, 
and where your ranch is and where your mailbox is and these kinds of things. So that's kind of the trick is getting the wide net and then closing it back up. And that's where you see the altruism happening. Does that help a little bit? Okay. I'd like to move venues. Keep your questions. She's going to be in the reception downstairs on the fifth floor. Uh, please join us all down there. Um, the protocol here is not to rush up and ask the questions here. We let her go downstairs, right? Get a glass of wine, and then you ask the questions. Okay? Let's thank her again for a wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.